now an oversight hearing on the Internal Revenue Service. Today, members of a House Government Reform Subcommittee heard testimony from IRS Commissioner Charles Rosati on the state of reform measures undertaken by his agency. Other speakers included representatives from the National Taxpayers Union, the General Accounting Office, and the National Treasury Employees Union. Congressman Steve Horn chairs the two-hour hearing. Committee on Government Management Information Technology will come to order. The only contact that most taxpayers have with the Internal Revenue Service is when they file their annual income tax return. Now, one week before the deadline, many taxpayers are frenetically and frantically focused on gathering the year's worth of documents and receipts needed to verify the accuracy of their own tax return. Taxpayers should expect prompt quality service from their government, especially from the agency that collects their money. But over the years, critics have bitterly complained about the agency's rude service or lack of any service at all, and I believe times have changed quite a bit now. The IRS has come under fire for everything from its failure to assist taxpayers in preparing and filing their tax forms to ensuring that all taxpayers pay their tax obligations. The IRS had indeed become the federal agency that everyone loved to hate. The public told the tax agency that it expects better services. And on July 22, 1998, Congress passed and the President signed the Internal Revenue Service Restructuring and Reform Act. Their message to the Internal Revenue Service was clear. There must be a fundamental change in the way it conducts business. The Internal Revenue Service must not only collect taxes, it must provide quality service to the people who pay those taxes. The law demanded that the Internal Revenue Service shift from its self-defined role as an enforcement agency toward a role that more resembles a financial service organization. Internal Revenue Service Commissioner Charles Rosati has taken that message seriously. He's responsible for planning and implementing the most fundamental changes in the IRS in nearly half a century. A few weeks ago, the Commissioner testified before another House subcommittee, stating that the IRS is, quote, wholly committed to implementing each and every taxpayer's rights provision and making them work as intended, while still fulfilling the mandate to collect taxes that are due. Some people are now concerned that the agency has become so user-friendly that it isn't collecting enough of the tax money that is owed. In a recent hearing before this subcommittee, we learned that taxpayers owe the people and the Treasury $231 billion in overdue taxes and penalties. We recognize that this is an enormous undertaking, filled with both short-term and long-term challenges. We welcome each of our witnesses today and look forward to discussing the agency's progress and challenges and how they are affecting the American people and the Internal Revenue Service workers. And I might say, Commissioner, I'm very pleased with the willingness of the IRS workers to come to our district office to f set up phones, to have hundreds of constituents go there and electronically file for the first time, in most cases, uh, to those constituents. And we hope down the line that we will all be sensitive to filing on file in time, and that would help get the refund if they had one, and it would also be simpler than most people now have to go to. So I now yield an opening statement to, to the ranking member, Mr. Turner, the gentleman from Texas. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. After having worked on my tax return yesterday, I hope I'm in a good mood here to visit with the commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> we do appreciate uh, the commissioner being here this morning, and as we all know, your agency is responsible for a the very difficult task that is administering and enforcing the internal revenue laws and related statutes. Your mission is to collect the proper amount of ta tax at the least cost to the public and in a manner that warrants the highest degree of public confidence in the service's integrity, efficiency, and fairness. We know the IRS has been subject to many studies and congressional inquiries and much criticism. Congress and others have identified a long list of problems, including inadequate technology, poor services to taxpayers, violation of taxpayers' rights, failure to establish, uh, follow established procedures, and lack of adequate employee training and resources. This concern led the Congress 
to uh, pass the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act of 1998. This law included many provisions to enhance taxpayer rights and to fund fundamentally reform the IRS. To achieve these goals, the IRS uh, plans to make fundamental changes on vo virtually every front. The IRS has referred to this process as modernization because it involves building on the essential components that have made the IRS successful in the past while bringing them up to date in a way designed to achieve the new mission. We're here today to, to assess the progress the IRS has made in implementing its modernization changes. This subcommittee wants to ensure that all federal managers are given the necessary tools and incentives to perform effectively and to be held accountable for their job. We welcome the commissioner this morning, and I commend you, Commissioner Rossetti, on your leadership. I uh, commend the employees of the IRS and your efforts to become a better agency. Uh, when I came to Congress three years ago, the IRS uh, had an image that was less than desirable. And since that time, with the new legislation and the efforts you've made, uh, I'm confident there's been significant progress toward the goal of providing the type of high quality service that the taxpayers of this country expect and deserve. And I appreciate the leadership you have brought to the position, and I look forward to hearing your testimony this morning. Thank you. As uh, you know, Commissioner, and the others that follow you, uh, we swear in all witnesses before this committee. So if you'd raise your right hand, uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And we also, I think you know, as you're a regular here, uh, your full statement goes in the record right now, as well as resumes. So we would appreciate it if you could summarize it, and then we'll have more chance for dialogue. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Turner, uh, what we are doing at the IRS, we think, is following the clear direction of the Congress in the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act. And as both uh, both of you noted in your opening statements, this involves some of the most significant changes in organization, technology, and most importantly, the way we serve taxpayers. Uh, we're already witnessing some positive results. These include the implementation of the 71 uh, taxpayer rights that were in the act, uh, improved uh, hours and improved phone service, and more electronic filing in this current season. Uh, just to note some statistics, we expect to receive 127 million individual returns this season. And electronic filing is up 16% over last year. So we'll get about 34 to 35 million returns electronically. Our level of telephone service overall is about 63% this year, uh, which is still way too low, but is up a lot from the 50% or so from last year. And for the whole year, we expect to collect $1.67 trillion in net receipts for the Treasury. And of course, all of this has been done after the completion of the enormous program to fix the Y2K problem which I'm pleased to say was accomplished almost flawlessly. Uh, just going back for a moment to Y2K, uh, I think that this success was achieved uh, due to comprehensive planning and preparations over a significant period of time. And Mr. Chairman, we're most grateful for your guidance and assistance, which you provided uh, over that entire period. We think your leadership was a critical component of our success. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Despite some of these signs of progress, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have to say uh, honestly that today the IRS does not meet all the legitimate service expectations of the vast majority of compliant taxpayers. And at the same time, our compliance activities, such as exam and collections, continues to drop. Further, as GAO has pointed out, many of the systems we use to manage and account for the $1.67 trillion in tax revenue are inherently deficient. So these are severe problems, and if they were not addressed, they would certainly, over time, undermine the fairness and perhaps even the viability of the federal tax system. But these problems are not newly identified, nor do I believe that they are impossible to solve. And in fact, I think we now have in place the top-level plans that will allow us to address them. We have implemented the taxpayer rights provisions of RRA. We've completed a new system of balanced performance measures, and our reorganization which is aimed at increasing customer focus and management accountability is progressing rapidly, and we have a new top management team in place. Building on this foundation, we are now beginning the longer-term program of re-engineering all of our business practices and technology 
so that we will be able to deliver on the RA's mandates for improved service and taxpayer treatment, while also increasing fairness and compliance effectiveness. As these new management and technology practices become in place, we can also, we believe, improve efficiency. However, to succeed in this enormous program, we do need adequate budget resources in FY 2001 to address critical operational needs in the short run and to invest in new technology for the long run. The rapidly expanding economy continues to increase the IRS's workload. For example, since 1993, the number of individual tax returns of over $100,000, which are generally the more complex returns, have increased by 63%. But because of budget constraints, the IRS staff has dropped by 17,000 personnel, which are shown uh, on the chart at your left, shows the workload going up, the staff going down. On top of these general trends, as shown in the second chart, which is going to be put up there, certain specific provisions of RRA alone have required about 4,500 additional personnel to administer. Uh, and those are just listed by code section there, an estimate of personnel. Now, since our compliance personnel, those that do exams and collections, represent the largest component of the IRS budget, and they are also the ones that administer these RRA provisions, our net frontline compliance staffing has declined quite rapidly, which is shown here uh, in this red line on the third chart. So uh, I think we can see that as a result of these resource declines and the pervasive change in the way that the business has done, uh, there has been not only resource declines, but some uncertainty, confusion, and a great deal of relearning among our employees and managers. And this it combined is the reason that overall the number of exam and collection cases we've been able to complete has declined about in half over the, since 1997. To address these operational problems, we have requested an increase in staffing in the 2001 budget, which would provide for about 2,800 FTEs and would allow us uh, to rectify some of the shortages that have developed over the last, uh, uh, the last two years. Um, and that would be one component in the budget. This staffing increase uh, increment will allow us to meet uh, some critical short-term needs while we transition to the more efficient structure and re-engineered technology, which is the second key need in our FY 2000 budget. And as I think you've pointed out many times, Mr. Chairman, is really the long-term solution that we need to, uh, to get to. Uh, clearly, we depend on our computer systems to administer the tax system and to properly collect and account for our $1.8 trillion of tax revenues. Uh, we have submitted our plan for re-engineering our systems in some detail, uh, and they are included in my written testimony and in the funding request that we've made to, uh, to the appropriations committees. Let me stress that although there is no way to avoid risk in a program of this size and complexity, we believe we can manage these risks and achieve our goals just as we did with the $1.4 billion Y2K program. And we now have in place some of the elements needed to do this properly, which were not in place in the past. And these include a single centrally managed information systems organization, a very active top-level governance process, uh, adherence to architectural, technological, and methodological standards, use of the prime contract to manage development and integration activities, and most importantly, an unwavering commitment to an open process that includes outside oversight agencies such as GAO, TIGDA, and OMB. Now, although we have put in place most of the necessary elements, I do want to stress, Mr. Chairman, that it will take time and practical experience executing projects for our management process to mature. And I would like to call the subcommittee's attention to a fourth chart, which is about to be put up uh, on the screens up here, which really shows what I would consider the normal pattern by which we'd expect our management process to mature over time if we are successful. Based on my experience in the industry, if we were to achieve the kind of growth rate detected on this chart, it would actually be a quite rapid rate of growth in maturity of our management process. And within one to two years, I think it would put IRS in a top category of institutions managing large technology programs. Since this maturity process necessarily depends on practical experience, one of our most important responsibilities as top managers is to adjust the level of activity we're managing to that which is appropriate to the level of management capacity we have at any point in time. And we've already seen this process in action as we have unhesitatingly revised some initial proposals to slow down some projects and rearrange others to ensure that management and architectural issues were uh, adequately addressed. 
On the other hand, I also have to stress that there is no way to achieve maturity in the management process without practical experience actually executing projects. So, Mr. Chairman, I believe we are making real progress on the goals and mandates of the Restructuring Act. I think if Congress will continue to provide us the support for IRS modernization, which includes acting favorably on our budget request, I think we will be able to produce the most visible, tangible changes in service, compliance, and productivity that the America's taxpayers expect and deserve. Thank you. Well, we thank uh, you. We have a few questions for you, and we will be alternating between Mr. Turner and myself five minutes at a time. And uh, let me first start. There's a lot of different groups, including the OMB, the IG, Inspector General, that give you recommendations. Tell me how you go about prioritizing which is which, and particularly the Inspector Generals. Well. The, you are right, Mr. Chairman. We get hundreds of uh, recommendations every year from you know, many different uh, audits that are done by the IG as well as GAO, and of course many other uh, things that come in from congressional sources and from especially our stakeholders such as uh, the practitioner groups, taxpayer groups, there are hundreds of them. And um, what we have uh, in, put in place over the last two years is a uh, management process which we uh, call taxpayer treatment and service improvement by which uh, we have a, a small program staff that, that, that reviews all of these and lists all of these recommendations, tries to apply criteria to them, and then comes before uh, a top management group, which I chair, to, uh, to basically determine which ones we can manage in which time frames. Now, we're going to a new phase of that in, in the next year as we establish our new organization, where we're folding this process into a more, even more systematic strategic planning and budgeting process where we will include this kind of prioritization as part of our uh, planning and budgeting. And we're, as a matter of fact, have already started that for fiscal 2002, uh, as well as 2001, uh, which is, of course, the budget that's before Congress. So we made a I think an important step uh, in, in, in prioritizing and managing these uh, recommendations, and now we're going even further with strategic planning. I think, the, of course, the, the crux of this is that we have more demands on our capacity than we can, than we can implement. Uh, you know, in other words, we have more things that would, we would like to do and that others would like us to do than we have capacity to manage. So we simply have to make choices along the way. How much, uh, if any, do you get from that advisory committee that was uh, put together to uh, sort of guide the commissioner under the Restructuring and Reform Act of IRS? Now, who's on and who isn't? Have all the appointees been nominated? Yes, the, I think you're referring to the Oversight Board, as That's it's right. termed in the Act. And they were nominated, they were acted upon um, by the Senate uh, Finance Committee favorably um, in, um, I believe it was February, and it's now on the Senate floor waiting for action uh, to, to go through the Senate floor. That would be the last step before they would become active. And there are seven private uh, sector members, as well as the Commissioner and the, and the Secretary of the Treasury. So there have been no meetings yet because they have not been finally confirmed, but we have had some informal discussions when they were preparing for their for their confirmation hearings, actually, at some length. And I think that these, in fact, I know that these members are all um, very qualified people who are quite fired up, as a matter of fact, about the idea of participating in this. And so I am looking forward to having them. And of course, one of their statutory responsibilities is precisely the point that you were noting in your question, is participating in the strategic planning process to help us uh, make the right choices. Uh, for uh, how we deploy our resources and what initiatives we undertake. The law took effect when? Well, the law took effect uh, July of 98. It, it, it requested the president so to So we've lost almost two years from that particular committee. Well, yes. I, that wasn't your fault. That was the president's fault. He didn't like the system. So is that going to work? I mean, they now have got them, well, you say, before the Senate. Hopefully, they'll be confirmed one way or the other. Yeah, well, uh, the, the, I mean, I was somewhat involved, tangentially involved. It's quite a process to find seven private sector qualified people and get them through all the clearances. That certainly took a longer than expected. But I, I think that 
without question, at this point, there's strong support now for, I think, all quarters for making this, this, this oversight board work. Uh, uh, you know, I've met quite a few times with the Secretary of the Treasury about this, and he is, he is committed to it. He's met with them, and, you know, we have a plan, you know, to get them oriented. So I think as soon as they are confirmed by the Senate, we'll be ready to really gear up. Um, and I, you know, I really anticipate that they will be a very constructive force in helping us really have the continuity to make this whole process work. My last question on this round is the computing situation. Uh, you went through Y2K. That caused you to look at uh, various systems. Should you merge some? Should you get rid of some? We've asked the General Accounting Office to look across the whole executive branch to look at the hardware and the software. I wonder, you're an expert in this area. What are your plans? Well, I think you're quite right. I mean, as one of the residual benefits of Y2K is that we did standardize and consolidate quite a few different systems. Um, I mean, and we also, I think importantly, um, and probably one of the most important things, is that we centralized all of the information systems resources under one management. I mean, previously we had about 15 different information, roughly 15 different information systems organizations. We now have one and they control almost essentially all the resources. We have consolidated our mainframes. Uh, by the end of this year, we'll have them all into three centers instead of uh, 12. Uh, and we've eliminated you know, thousands of one-off type uh, vendor products that were on desktops, for example. So that was an important uh, benefit of Y2K. We still have more work to do in that regard, but I think that is one of the foundational elements that gives us, you know, gives us a foundation to start going up this S-curve that we need to get to, to to manage in a more effective way. Thank you. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, the, the growth in electronic filing uh, seems to be uh, impressive, but I gather that most of the electronic filing that takes place under current law has to go through th some third party in order to accomplish it, rather than electronically filing directly with the IRS. Uh, why is that the case, and is there anything we could or should do about that? Well, as a matter of fact, that is one of the uh, issues that we're addressing in the whole strategic plan for electronic filing. I think the one thing that is important to understand is that preparing a return electronically is a prerequisite for filing electronically. Those two processes are very closely linked. I mean, you can't file something electronically until you've prepared it. In order to prepare it, you have to have tax preparation software. And I think if you've ever used any of this software, you know that there are quite a few software products out there on the market that are very sophisticated and really quite, quite effective uh, consumer software products. So the route that the IRS has, has taken is to uh, essentially try to, par and this was actually a provision in the Restructuring Act encouraged us to do this, was to partner with the private sector to encourage competition in the private sector to bring down the cost and make it easier to file electronically by taking advantage of the capabilities that are offered in the private sector. I, we don't see it as the, the right strategy to try to separate these two parts of the equation, if you will, the preparation and the filing. Instead, uh, what, what we are working on, and there's a provision actually in the President's budget um, for this uh, uh, that, that was just submitted earlier this year, which uh, requests or requires the IRS by 2002 to be able to, working with private industry, find a way to allow every taxpayer to file, prepare, both prepare and file their taxes on the web at no cost to the taxpayer. And uh, we think that's really what taxpayers want. And as a matter of fact, even in this season, that's possible on a limited basis because there are a number of providers that provide software on the web that allow you to prepare your tax re return and send it to the, to the IRS. Uh, many of them charge a fee of $9.95, $9.95, and some of them charge no fee, however. Um, and this is because of competition driving down the prices. What, what, we, what we've been requested in the President's budget to do and will continue to do uh, is to work with the industry to provide ways, and this may require us to provide some incentives to the industry, to basically drive that price down to zero so that every taxpayer would be able to sign on to the web, uh, use that 
in a secure way to prepare their tax return, and it, which is, I think, uh, the thing that people get the most benefit out of, just being able to use the question and answer format to prepare their tax return, and then just push a button and, and file it up through us. Is there any statutory uh, inhibition to doing that now? Isn't there a problem with the signature and well, it works now. The, the, Does okay, the taxpayer the, get something back in hard copy by mail right, and they sign right. it and send it back? Yeah, now, th there's, a, there's a second issue. Even if you do file, you now have to send in a separate, in some, most cases, you have to send in a separate signature document. We have some pilot projects this year where uh, we've sent out uh, specific identification numbers that uh, avoid the need to send in the, the paper document. And one of our highest priorities is to figure out how we can extend those pilots basically to everyone or almost everyone um, so that they would not have to send in that paper jurat as it's called and I we do not at this moment think we need special additional you know uh, legislative authority we think that uh, it's more a matter of administrative action to ensure ourselves that we have adequate authentication of the document of the return that the taxpayer has filed well how then do you get a signature on that return so that the uh signature line, which is the taxpayer's attestation that they're providing the correct information under penalty of law. How do you get that well, electronically? What we're, doing, what we're doing now in our pilot projects is using um, pins, as we call them, uh, personal identification numbers. Uh, many taxpayers uh, received, uh, I don't remember the exact number, I can get it for you, but we sent out letters to quite a few millions of taxpayers prior to the season, giving them personal identification numbers, which they could then enter in in lieu of a, of a, a signature, in lieu of a uh, hand signature, as the authentication that, that it was a valid tax return. Thank you. I think uh, we had the staff furnish you a, uh, an appeal from a particular constituent in Colorado. Uh, and his uh, point is very interesting. This is Kenny Knapp of Steamboat Springs, Colorado. He received a reply to his appeal from the district director, Deborah Decker, and he felt that the uh, proper authority to write him on that was the Secretary of Treasury. And I wonder if you've had a chance to look at that, and uh, do you feel that uh, uh, the uh, district director, Deborah Decker, has that authority from the Treasury or not? Well, first of all, I, as you know, I can't specifically comment on, on a particular taxpayer matter, but I think that it's been well established that the secretary des designates and delegates certain authority to take certain actions uh, to the commissioner, and the commissioner in turn can redelegate them to uh, other authorized individuals. That's the way the tax system has worked for, for you know, many, many years. And it really has to because you have to be able to delegate authority for people to act or you couldn't really function, you know, at the scale that we function. Well, uh, is there a, a delegation from the Secretary of the Treasury? And what is the source of that? Is, is it a regulation of the Secretary? Uh, there are delegation orders, in effect, as they're called, that delegate, um, generally speaking, and um, I can give you more technical answers in writing in response, but basically the, the, the way it works is that the law frequently uh, authorizes the secretary to do certain things, uh, and then uh, the secretary uh, has standing delegation orders that delegates to certain officials, usually the commissioner, to take action. And then within the agency, we have official delegation orders that delegate certain other officials to take certain other kinds of action. That was really in relation to a deficiency notice, and uh, so you feel that you have sufficient authority from the Secretary of the Treasury, because yes. often Congress over the years, and not just in IRS, has taken the authority away from the President, taken it away from Cabinet officers, and vested it in the person that uh, really is responsible for the operation. So you don't feel a loss of uh, I, I, authority I, I, there. I don't, and and I'd be glad to give you a more you know a more specific answer well, in writing. But with generally, with, without I think objection, those... we'll put it in the record in this place. Right. Uh, now on the modernization efforts, uh, and uh, when they might be made, I'd like to give you a little time. You've mentioned it. Uh, but to just give us an idea of where some of this modernization is going besides the electronic aspect. What else is there? Well, there is an entire program of what we call their, our major business systems modernization, 
which is really aimed at replacing all of the basic systems that are deficient in the IRS that support basic tax administration processing, as well as, I might add, the financial management systems, which I know in your committee you've had a great deal of concern about, because that are really at the root of a lot of our problems. These go to basic systems that keep all the taxpayer records, for example. That's the most fundamental system. We still keep all of our taxpayer accounts on tape files and a system that was designed in the 60s. It's hard to believe this. Sometimes when I say this, people think I'm exaggerating, but it really is true. Okay, there, there really is every single taxpayer's records, business and individual, is on tape files that are only updated once a week. This is the heart of our entire system. And then there are about 130 other systems uh, that do everything from collecting money to accounting for money uh, to helping to support auditing of taxpayers. And then, of course, the actual customer assistance. If somebody calls up and wants to find out where their refund is or there's a mistake on their account, to fix that is quite a laborious process. All of these are what we call our basic tax administration systems. Um, and frankly, Mr. Chairman, I think I've testified before, this agency is very, very deep in the hole in this matter. This is not a matter of you know, most businesses today are going forward with their basic, you know, like if you're a bank, their demand deposit system is there, okay? They know how many debits and credits there are in somebody's bank account. What they're working on is putting it on the web and, you know, making it easier for people to do banking over the web. We're going back to the foundations and rebuilding, you know, if you will, the equivalent of our basic checking account system, uh, which I, I can't stress too much is, is, is really an essential thing for this country. I, I, we're, every day, we see examples of, of really horrible problems that we have in, in, in just administering the tax laws because of the limits of these systems. Unfortunately, we're so far behind that this is not an easy process to, 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 to fix. We have in place now, over the last year and over the last several years, put together the outlines of a plan of how to do this. And we are now beginning to launch this process. In fact, we've just within the last several months, submitted the first large request to the, our appropriations committees to get money released from the fund that has been established to provide this. At the same time, what we're doing is we're building, as is shown on this curve, the management process that we need in place. It's a very complex, large-scale program, and as GAO and many others have observed, the IRS in the past has not had in place the management process to do this. We're putting that process in place to actually make it work take some time and some experience. Um, and so it's not an instantaneous process. And it can't be done just by reading textbooks and by, um, you know, by going to training classes. I mean, we can't build a world-class football team by just, you know, reading, watching videotapes uh, of, 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 of football games. Um, so we have to proceed in a measured pace. And I think one of the most important responsibilities that I feel I have and my top management team that's working on this, and you've met Mr. Cosgrave and some others, is to try to really manage this process so the level of uh, pro the, the, the level of activity we undertake in terms of making actual projects go forward, initiating projects, is 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 managed in relation to the capacity we have to manage them. You know, and that's sort of an ever changing, ever changing process. However, just to put the bottom line as to what I expect to happen is that if we get the released uh, ex uh, approval we expect from the committees to release funds, we will be launching. Uh, some the first real significant development projects which will deliver some initial capabilities in next year in 2001. These will be mainly in the area of customer service and customer communications. And then basically every year for the next, you know, as far as we can plan at this point, at least five years, every, every year at least once and possibly twice a year we will be delivering additional uh, new capacity into the system. And um, this will include the, not only the electronic services, the e-filing, and customer communications, but I think one of the most important of all these is uh, the taxpayer accounts database because, again, we need to get rid of that 35-year-old tape file before we can do anything else. And I think we finally have a plan as to how to do that in a, in a sort of a, uh, a way that it has acceptable risk. One other area I'll mention that I know has been important to, 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 to you, Mr. Chairman, as well as Mr. Turner, is the whole area of debt collection. You know, we've talked about this. I, we, we now have, I think, the outline, at least, of a plan to replace the technology that we need and to com basically completely re-engineer this process. And I could, don't have time to go through it this morning, but I think when we get to that, uh, we will have something that will basically have the effect of allowing us to act much more quickly on overdue accounts, which right now is, is not one of our forefronts. We're very slow. 
uh, to act much more quickly on potential or actual overdue accounts and also use our resources more efficiently to use, do, do the collection the right way. If it all it takes is a phone call, we'll only make a phone call. If it really takes a collection officer to go out there, we can, we can do that. And this in turn might provide us some broader opportunities such as the ones I know you, you're interested in to use other resources, perhaps outside resources to supplement our own because basically we will have in process with this collection system what we really need to manage our collection process. But this is, this is not going to happen in a year. This is going to take a couple years. You uh, mentioned in this answer uh, that you have two committees now. That's Senate Finance and House Ways and Means, or are you also including the Appropriations Well, on this matter, it's the Appropriations Committees, actually, that we have to work with to get the money released. So this would be Mr. Colby's uh, yes. subcommittee? Yes, sir. And on the Senate side, the uh, same? Senator Campbell, yes. Senator Campbell. Now, yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. Uh, Commissioner, you mentioned your efforts to try to improve debt collection. Uh, as you know, and uh, your staff is aware, I introduced a bill, H.R. 4181, uh, last week joined uh, by Chairman Horn as well as uh, Chairman Burton and Ranking Member Waxman, and uh, as I recall, most of the members of our subcommittee, to try to help on your debt collection problem. Uh, as you know, the law has provided for some time under the Debt Collection Act that if a person owes a non-tax debt to the government, they can't go out and get federal contracts and get federal loans and other government benefits. And so we wanted to close that loophole by providing that tax debt is now subject to those same rules. So that if you owe tax debt, you can't get an SBA loan until you make arrangements to pay your tax debt, or you can't enter into a contract to sell the government uh, some equipment or services if you owe taxes unless you make arrangement to pay those taxes. And I know your staff's been kind to take a look at the bill and I want to ask you just three questions. One is, did you, do you feel the concept is good uh, with regard to it? And then I wanted you to comment on whether you thought you could administratively handle this task and whether you felt uh, good about the efforts we've made to to address the privacy concerns with the provision that we have in there that says the taxpayer is the one that'll sign the consent form to release the information as to whether or not they owe any taxes. And that form would be promulgated by your office, but it would go to you and then you would respond back to the agency. Let, let me just talk about the administrative one first, because that's the one that most directly affects us, that I think that, um, t that we could administer that provided uh, in the short term if the volume of transactions was relatively limited. And the only limitation there is because of our computer systems, a lot of this kind of ish stuff has to be handled semi-manually right now. So as long as it wasn't too large a volume of transactions, which I don't think it would be if it was federal contracts, we could, we could manage that. In the longer term, we'd be able to manage a larger volume you know, as we modernize our computer systems. But in the short term, that would be the only issue administratively is just uh, how, how large the volume of transactions would be. Um, as far as the, the privacy issue, uh, I think that certainly requiring a disclosure uh, consent by the taxpayer would be, would be an appropriate step, would be the right and necessary step uh, to conform to the um, requirements of, uh, of disclosure. We, we need that under our 6103. Uh, which is the section of the tax code that deals with taxpayer privacy. I think that on the broader issue of, of privacy, there is, um, I guess, a long-standing and probably never-ending debate over the broader question of whether it's the right policy decision to use tax information for other legitimate government purposes. Um, that's more of a broader policy issue. The Treasury probably takes the lead on that rather than the IRS. The Joint Committee has um, issued a report just recently on this very subject, uh, uh, which dealt with, with um, disclosures of tax records, even with consent of taxpayers to other federal agencies for other various other purposes. And what they simply said was that they felt that it should be done only if there's, quote, a compelling case made by the part of the other agency, whether, whether it's a compelling case or not um, is, is a question. Um, but I think that from the point of view of helping us to collect tax debt um, to the extent that we had additional, uh, you know, incentives, if you will, built into the taxpayers to actually pay those taxes, that could only, that could only help us. Thank you. I, I want to thank 
your staff for helping us on the bill. Um, we're going to have a hearing uh, on May the 9th, as I recall, Mr. Chairman, that you've set. And I, I welcome any of your staff's input sure. uh, between now and then or at the hearing sure. to be sure that we do this right. Uh, sure. The objective Certainly. clearly is to enhance uh, collection of taxes, but to do it in a way that's uh, appropriate. Mm -hmm. So uh, any help that your staff can give us is welcome. Be happy on to. This. Thank you very pleased much. Please do that. I thank the gentleman, and it is on May 9th, a Tuesday, 10 a.m., right here. And so look forward for future action. Let me ask you about uh, the General Accounting Office uh, testimony before this subcommittee recently. They said the uh, Internal Revenue Service Chief Financial Officer is not appropriately placed in the organization to address serious financial and operational problems. What action is being taken by you and your management team to address this particular problem? Because we had a real concern over the lack of internal methods for looking at the financial statements. Mr. Chairman, it's always a pleasure to be here and be able to give a clear, simple, straightforward answer that we fixed that problem. Uh, in this case, I can honestly do that because we have successfully recruited and appointed um, Mr. Rogers as the Chief Financial Officer, and he now reports uh, as of about two weeks ago uh, directly to the Office of the Commissioner. That includes myself and the Deputy Commissioner. I, the reason it's stated that way is there are certain matters that I'm recused from with respect to financial systems, uh, but the Deputy Commissioner, Mr. Wenzel, who's here with me today, uh, will, will take my place in those cases. But the important point is Mr. Rogers is now, number one, appointed on a uh, permanent basis. He was previously acting. And secondly, he is reporting up directly to the Office of the Commissioner. We've also made certain other realignments to give him some more authority and, and staff. And so I believe that I could honestly say at this point that we fixed whatever concerns there might have been in that regard. They have been definitively addressed. Um, so you're very happy with it. On that particular point, okay. we have. I know I have to say that we still have a tremendous amount of work to do. Um, to address many of the issues in financial systems, uh, or not just financial systems, but our whole accounting process. Some of them, Mr. Rogers and his team, with the support of Mr. Wenzel, I believe will be able to address this year in a very uh, you know, active way. They relate to such things as reconciling balances with the Treasury and uh, hopefully working on our property management. Others, of course, as GAO itself have noted, are really longer-term issues related to technology modernization. They have to do with fixing the basic accounting systems. Um, those will not be fixed this year, obviously, but we will be working on the plans that will allow us to replace those systems longer term. The uh, senior counselor of the National Taxpayers Union, Mr. David Keating, uh, noted in his testimony, which is about to come, that uh, the uh, Treasury Secretary Summers said many times that the uh, Board of Oversight is unnecessary and unwise. And the long delay, quote, the long delay in submitting the nominations raises the question of whether the administration is seeking to revamp the IRS on its own without the oversight and input of the legally required IRS Oversight Board. It also suggests to taxpayers the IRS reform is a low priority issue for the administration. And then he says, quote, we were also disappointed that none of the nominees appear to have, as required by law, professional experience and expertise in the needs and concerns of taxpayers, unquote. Do you want to make some comments on that? I realize they aren't your nominees. Yeah, well, first of all, as far as the issue, though, of whether, um, whether the Treasury Department supports this whole concept, I mean, it's a fair statement that in the early stages when the bill was being debated that, that there was a great debate about this and exactly what the powers of the board should be. But uh, I think that threshold was crossed long ago, frankly. And uh, I worked very closely with the secretary. I can tell you the secretary <laughs> was probably, uh, especially towards the end of last year, as frustrated as anybody else at various things that caused us not to get these nominations up there. Um, I can tell you just one thing is, is that going through the clearance process to get a private sector person who's never been in the government before into this, because they go through the same thing that you would go as if you were a full-time employee, is, uh, is really quite a, 
quite an interesting process. And it's not only lengthy, but in some cases it caused people to drop out. So it was very difficult. Uh, I do not believe, from my observation, that, that the delay uh, was caused by uh, the Treasury Department not wanting this to happen. It's true, in the early stages, they were against it. But once they changed, and uh, they, they, they did get behind it, and, and I think that they absolutely, and the, the Secretary does want this to work. Now we've had the nominees, and they're in the Senate, so it's just a matter of the Senate acting, and we'll get them there. Uh, I mean, as far as the, the nominees themselves, I can only say that, I mean, we have a, a wide range of nominees um, that cover such things as, you know, for example, Mr. Colby, that's not Congressman Colby, but the nominee, Mr. Colby, who actually is uh, one of Senator Grassley's constituents, and he's a cattle rancher from, from Iowa, small business person. Um, at the other side, we have people um, like Mr. Farr, who was, you know, ran American Express, you know, and had a lot of experience at the big business side. And we have, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Levitan, who was a very much of an expert in large-scale technology programs. So it is, it is a, um, you know, it is, it is a wide-ranging board. I don't know whether one can prove that it touches every base of all the things that were listed in the legislation, but I think it is a wide-ranging board, and they're certainly interested in. Um, in, 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 in the task that's been assigned to them from, from what I've seen from talking to them. Uh, well, my last question, I certainly agree with you, by the way, on it's a wonder we get anybody to serve in the executive branch of the federal government in terms of the forms, the ethics, the financial filings, and all the rest. So uh, it, these do take time, and I understand that. My last question is that you testified you've implemented the various taxpayer rights legal provisions. However, you stated you're several years away from making them work more efficiently and at higher quality. So I'd like you to elaborate on what you mean by that and what are you doing to address that situation? Well, what I mean by it is that that the, the taxpayer rights provisions uh, were very pervasive in their impact in the way that almost every employee or a large percentage of our employees works. Um, and many of them were quite complex. Uh, an example of what I mean, um, the innocent spouse provision. This was a very important provision, very high profile, and I think a very necessary change in the law. Uh, what happened at the time that, that the law was passed is that whereas there was one provision in the law that very limited circumstances allowed for relief of liability on a joint tax return, there are now four provisions including the one that was there before, and they're really quite finely tuned as, a, as appropriate to try to determine, you know, because you're here you're talking about taking basically a married couple that filed a joint tax return and now has split up, and you're trying to figure out who knew what about their tax return at the time they filed it. I mean, that's, that's not a simple thing to do. Then it adds to it an additional consideration, which the IRS has not really been required to do in the past, to my knowledge, which is deal with equity. In the past, it was strictly, you know, who owed the money. On, on this particular provision, as well as some others, there's now what's called equitable relief. Well, you know, figuring out what is appropriate to give equitable relief to one spouse in a marriage on a tax liability is something that takes some time to learn. So we, we went forward and got out forms, and we, we, we let people file claims, because they were, as, as was required, and we began to adjudicate those claims. But learning how to do it correctly and learning how to do it in a reasonable amount of time has been quite a challenge. And I think we have made some big progress. Again, it's a curve like that. It's a learning curve. It, you just don't do it overnight. I think at this point, just taking that provision, we now have gotten out lots of guidance. We've, we've learned how to adjudicate some cases. We've taken advantage of that experience to re re revamp the training materials. We've done a whole bunch of things, which I won't go into here. So now we're at a point where I think we're starting to, A, do them in a timely manner, and secondly, do them correctly. Uh, you know, with higher assurance that they're being done correctly. That's an example. And there's 71 different provisions. I could give you a story like that on each one. Does the gentleman from Texas have any further questions? And Mr. Rosati, the commissioner will stay through the next panel and is prepared to answer questions that are raised by the panel, too. I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to make this point again about your need for funding for your modernization effort. I know you intend to go to the uh, appropriate committees and seek some uh, movement of funds within your agency. But the overall modernization effort uh, seems to me to be one that may very well and could detract from enforcement. And I don't think any of us would want that to occur. And 
I want to be sure that you've been able to make your case clearly for why you need additional funding for modernization. Uh, Mr. Turner, I think that, you know, what we have to do in the budget is to both do the modernization but also keep enforcing the tax laws at the same time. I mean, that's the two things that we have to do. And I think if you looked at the, some of the previous charts that were up there, I don't know whether, Floyd, you can put the previous one up. What has happened over the last, and this really is even before the Restructuring Act, but the budget was, was, was very constrained and the, the majority of the money is for the casework, for going out and auditing and collecting money. And what has happened, as you can see in that green line, that the number of, since 1995, the number of frontline people, this is in compliance, these are people that actually audit taxpayers, collect money. The green line is what was happening just to the staffing because of the budget. The red line shows that, that the gap between those two was the additional requirements of the Restructuring Reform Act that just required more time. So if you look at that red line, you can see that we're down in 2000, well below where we were uh, four years ago. And then there's even some intangible factors on top of that. The net effect is we have half the number of audits that we were doing three years ago. Nobody knows exactly what the right number is, but I don't think that kind of a line is, is where we, you know, we're really risking the tax system if we keep that line. So what we've proposed in the 2001 budget is two things, basically. One is stabilize that, okay? That's what we call it, stable. Give us enough staff to basically keep that from continuing to go down, keep it steady, and so we will no longer go down in terms of our compliance enforcement activities. And then the other piece of the money is for the modernization for the technology, which is really how we're gonna fix this. I mean, and we know that we can collect money more efficiently. I mean, I, I feel very confident of that. Um, it does require some, some people, but we can leverage those people with more procedures and better technology, but it's gonna take a few years to get to that point. And in my last comment, I want to, for those of us who are struggling to get our tax return in, April 15th is on Saturday this year. Does that mean we have to have it in the post office? Can we get it postmarked by April 15th on a Saturday? Well, I think that um, that um, it's actually come to the 17th is, is the day that, All right. uh, that it so, has to be So done. you actually can, can actually deposit your tax return in the post office on Monday and still be in compliance with the law? Yes, sir. And I also want to mention, for those who may be interested in a phone number, 1-800-829-1040 is where you can get information. Among uh, there are several other options available as well uh, for taxpayers, but that is the 24-hour, seven-day-a-week, toll-free phone number, is it not? The 1-800-829-1040. Yes, sir. Well, uh, for those who are struggling, as I am, to meet the deadline, uh, I urge them to take advantage of that number. And I noticed that your website is becoming much more popular uh, in the past. I believe you had uh, twice as many hits this year as you did last year. Uh, and that um, uh, IRS.gov uh, is another place where yes, taxpayers sir. can get help. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I can tell you that this calendar year through the end of March, we had 658 million hits on that website. So it's really quite a popular one and one of our best products. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we thank you. That's good information for the average citizen. Uh, well, Commissioner, I'm done asking questions with you, and I'll go to the next panel. And I must say, you're a brave commissioner to stay here and when your critics are there. And uh, most of the other people just run. <laughs> well, we're happy to stay. We consider them very constructive Well, I know you critics. are, and that's uh, why you've got good relations on Capitol Hill. So we will now have panel two, Margaret Wrightson of the General Accounting Office, uh, Colleen Kelly uh, of the Treasury Employees Union, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ovison, uh, the National Taxpayer Advocate, and David Keating, National Taxpayers Union. So if you'll stand and raise your right hand, and if there's anybody going to assist you on the answers, have them stand also. So we have uh, four at the witness table, three in back for a total of seven. So do you uh, swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, the three uh, helpers and the four witnesses are certified, noted the clerk. And we will now start with Margaret Wrightson, the Associate Director, Tax Policy Administration Issues of the United States General Accounting Office, um, the programmatic uh, arm of the legislative branch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Can you hear me? 
Uh, please get it closer. Okay. It isn't your fault. It's just that this was uh, we doing? put together in 1890, roughly, and they uh, haven't improved it that's since That's earlier then. than IRS's systems. Okay. Right. Um, Move it close to you. Move it closer. Even closer? Okay. Even closer, yes. All right. How's that? That's good. Okay. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, Mr. Turner, thank you very much for inviting me here this morning to discuss IRS's progress on key elements of its modernization efforts. Let me begin with my three bottom line conclusions. In each case, it's important to say at the outset that there is substantial agreement between GAO and IRS on the issues and actions IRS must take. First, before taxpayers will see any appreciable benefits from modernization, IRS needs to make breakthrough changes in its business practices and become more customer friendly. Second, if IRS is to better balance the value it historically has placed on compliance with the value it now wishes to place on customer service, it needs to revamp its performance management system. And finally, modernization will not succeed unless IRS follows through on important tasks for information systems modernization, most notably complete its enterprise system architecture and systems development life cycle. With regard to business practice changes, IRS has already completed a number of developmental steps that will help it redefine the way it does business, including establishing an organizational structure built around customer-focused operating divisions. Reorganization is going reasonably well, but the agency must also re-engineer business practices. Breakthrough changes are needed because IRS's current processes are not well suited to taxpayers' needs. Uh, IRS has a number of re-engineering uh, efforts underway, and the commissioners mentioned a few. I'd like to highlight three this morning. The first one is something called that we're going to call creating one-stop shopping at IRS walk-in centers. Taxpayers, as you know, have long been frustrated in trying to reach the right person at IRS. In large part, their frustration came from IRS's old structure that was kind of a transactional assembly line for addressing taxpayer inquiries, clarifying and correcting tax returns, and collecting unpaid taxes. Because of this stovepipe structure, IRS really couldn't take care of taxpayers on an end-to-end -end basis. To help solve the problem, IRS has established a new position that can handle a much larger uh, range of taxpayer problems. It's called the Tax Resolution Representative, or TRR. TRRs will still perform traditional duties like answering taxpayer questions and helping prepare returns, but they also will be able to do compliance work like installment agreements, lien and levy um, releases, account adjustments, and simple audits. Uh, IRS intends to have about 2,000 TRRs on staff by fall 2001. Now, implementing the TRR concept is, of course, going to require substantial investments in people and systems. Probably the greatest human capital challenge for IRS will be the cross-training that's going to be needed. But TRRs are also going to need enhanced IT so they can have access to complete and up-to-date account information, or they won't be able to be successful at this new role. The second example I want to mention is one that's been mentioned previously, which is electronic filing. During filing season, we all see commercials of tired and frazzled taxpayers. This year, my personal favorite saga this year is on a taxpayer who's on day 20 of trying to uh, paper file his family's return. The commercial's pretty funny. I mean, the taxpayer is, uh, has got hands full of pencils, his hair's uncombed, his shirt tail's hanging out. But the fact is that paper filing a tax return is really no laughing matter. Um, electronic filing or e-filing is not going to make the tax code any simpler. Um, but it can reduce the wear on taxpayers from filing itself. E-filing also reduces the calculation and transcription errors that later trigger IRS notices, and that's all to the good as well. But e-filing will benefit IRS. I don't know how many of you have been to an IRS service center, but I think it's fair to say that IRS is drowning in paper. Um, the, the returns are literally piled to the ceiling in the halls at, at IRS service centers. Um, these returns must be opened and sorted and reviewed, transcribed, shipped, and stored. And then later, if, uh, t if IRS uh, employees need additional information, they have to get them shipped from where they are stored so they can have access to that paper return again. 
Although electronic filing promises to be win-win, however, uh, IRS is having difficulty making it sufficiently appealing. A major criticism is that e-filing is not yet paperless. IRS has been testing eliminating W-2s and signature documents and allowing people to pay balances using credit cards. The commissioner mentioned that in his testimony. However, um, before electronic filing can fully replace paper, IRS must enhance its technology to allow full, the full range of returns to be filed and also develop new marketing strategies for additional market segments. The last example that I want to point to of business process reengineering is something called risk-based uh, risk examination. Um, here I'm going to start with a personal story because I think while taxpayer benefits from one-stop shopping and e-filing are pretty obvious to all of us, I'm not sure it's so obvious why IRS is building a better mousetrap for auditing is going to benefit taxpayers. So, so let me use an example. When I was about uh, 10 years old, I remember standing on the porch with my dad, and the postman walked up. That was in the days when they, in fact, did walk up. He talked to my dad and handed him the mail. And, and after thanking the postman, my dad started sifting through that mail until he stopped and he stared at a very official looking document. And you're right, um, actually in retrospect, that was a notice from the IRS. Um, I'm never gonna forget as a 10 year old looking at my dad and seeing this big guy in the panic on his face when he looked at that envelope. And I'm also not gonna forget that he waited till my mom came home before he opened it up. I think he needed her moral support. Um, what's striking about my own little example is that it's not unusual. Um, no taxpayer wants to get a letter from the IRS in his or her mailbox, uh, unless, of course, it's a refund from the Treasury Department. Um, but they certainly don't want to be audited when they are compliant, nor do, when audited, do taxpayers prefer um, anything other than for their audits to be as efficient and targeted only to the questionable return items. Our past work has identified weaknesses in how IRS determines which taxpayers to audit. When IRS picks the wrong person or approaches an audit like a fishing expedition, everybody loses. Taxpayers are burdened unnecessarily and IRS wastes valuable resources. To improve the situation, IRS hopes to deploy something called risk-based examination, a model that will target audits more accurately and help determine which compliance strategies are actually going to be the most efficient and effective. If IRS's approach is successful, taxpayers and IRS will both benefit. But as was true for my first two examples, training, new technology, and more data about taxpayers are going to be critical if that business process is going to be re-engineered effectively. Okay, the second part of my testimony looks at IRS's efforts to revamp its performance management system. Before Congress enacted the Restructuring Act, there was an uneasy feeling on the Hill and elsewhere that IRS employees were so intent on assessing and collecting taxes that they did not give due regard to taxpayer needs and rights. The Restructuring Act mandated changes to IRS's performance management system, including a new mission statement to place greater emphasis on taxpayer needs. IRS now has that new mission statement and is in the process of revamping its performance management system. However, for the system to work, IRS employees will need to understand that customer service and compliance are intended to be complementary and not competing values and activities. Our work suggests that this relationship may not well be understood at IRS at this point. The commissioner does not view compliance and customer service as competing. Indeed, he has said that improvements in customer service will increase compliance among taxpayers who do not understand the applicable tax law requirements or find IRS's processes too daunting to deal with. Understanding that customer service and compliance activities are meant to work together will take time at IRS and an ample amount of communication and clear training, which I think is going to be mentioned by some of our subsequent witnesses. At the same time, however, it will be very important to ensure that IRS employees also understand that they can and should use the full range of IRS's enforcement tools to collect taxes owed by those who willfully fail to comply with the tax laws. Our second concern about performance management involves IRS's new system of balanced performance measures. 
Although IRS is on the right track with these measures and may well be regarded as a leader in the federal government in this area, it still does not yet have a key measure of performance. Mr. Chairman, that measure is a measure of voluntary compliance. <coughs> For over 30 years, until the early 1990s, IRS had measures of voluntary compliance that were developed by periodically auditing random samples of taxpayers' returns. In 1995, IRS formally canceled plans to continue the random audits because of concerns that it was overly costly and overly intrusive on compliant taxpayers. The commissioner has said that in the absence of such measures, informed decisions on strategies to improve voluntary compliance will be impossible. At this point, you might be wondering, why not just use data from audits that IRS does conduct to measure voluntary compliance? The answer is that that data would not capture the extent of voluntary compliance among all taxpayers. Using only audit results is actually akin to using information about speeding tickets to measure how many drivers are driving safely. As anyone who has ever ventured onto the Washington Beltway knows, just because a driver doesn't get ticketed doesn't mean he or she is driving 55. Um, similarly, the results of IRS's audits tell you something about the population of taxpayers who are audited, but they tell you nothing about the population of taxpayers who are not. IRS is beginning to tackle the problem of how to measure voluntary compliance. But the solution likely will involve auditing some, and I say some, randomly selected returns, and IRS may have difficulty going forward without the support of key outside stakeholders. GAO believes that in moving forward on this, IRS should work diligently to minimize intrusion and burden on compliant taxpayers. However, we also believe in the principle of random selection when necessary to ensure the accuracy and integrity of IRS's results. The last part of my statement is on a topic that I know, uh, Chairman Horn, you're very familiar with, which focuses on IRS systems modernization challenges, which is a perennial problem at IRS. Although IRS's past track record in this area is dismal, Congress has supported IRS's most recent efforts to modernize its systems through the 1998 and 1999 Appropriations Acts and the establishment of the new technology account. In light of concerns about giving IRS free reign, however, Congress set certain conditions on spending, including requiring spending plans to ensure that IRS had the management and technical discipline to successfully design major software-intensive systems. It's this issue that the commissioner is referring to with his S-curve, um, I believe. Thus far, IRS has obligated about $68 million from its technology account and has submitted plans in March asking for approval to spend an additional $176 million. However, based on our review of IRS's most recent plan and reported progress, we have, con um, we have concluded that IRS is still not ready to build major software-intensive systems. As I noted earlier in my statement, IRS has not yet completed its enterprise systems architecture and systems development life cycle. Until we are convinced that IRS is ready, we will continue to designate its systems modernization efforts as high risk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can answer questions now or wait till you complete the rest of the panel. We're going to have everybody else uh, finish. Great. Each are going to f uh, summarize for five minutes each. That's 15 minutes, and then we'll still have a chance for questions and the commissioner. Uh, some answers to the questions. So uh, we will now go to Ms. Colleen M. Kelly, National President of the National Treasury Employees Union. Thank you, Chairman Horn, Ranking Member Turner, and members of the subcommittee. As the President of the National Treasury Employees Union, NTU represents more than 155,000 federal employees across the country, including the employees who work at the Internal Revenue Service. The IRS interacts with more citizens than any other government agency or private sector business. Twice as many people pay taxes as vote. Yet many Americans take for granted the outstanding work done by IRS employees. Following enactment of the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act of 1998, Commissioner Rosati set in motion a process to restore the public's confidence in the IRS. 
the commissioner recognized that any meaningful reform had to include the active participation of his chief assets, his employees. And employees have been involved in the reorganization work being done as we speak and going back to the enactment of RRA 98. I believe that modernization will succeed with the support of Congress and the dedicated work of IRS employees. And I believe Commissioner Rosati would agree with me that although the modernization of the IRS will require several more years of effort and commitment, the results so far have been positive. Communication between IRS management and the employees who make the IRS work has been crucial and will continue to be essential in improving customer service and increasing productivity at the IRS. I was pleased that Congress, too, recognized the importance of ensuring that the employee's voice in reforming the IRS be heard by insisting on an IRS or on an employee representative on the IRS Oversight Board, which was established through RRA 98. Congress recognized that an employee representative was necessary, not in spite of, but because of the important role of IRS employees in reform. NTEU takes great pride in the fact that we have had a cooperative relationship with the IRS dating back more than a decade. Our partnership efforts and employee efforts are constantly being tested, reworked, and revised in the face of budget restrictions and funding limitations and changes in the tax law. One particular area where NTEU and the IRS have worked together and where we feel we have made great strides has been in improving customer service. This has included not just providing longer office hours, but hours that meet customers' needs. Without the commitment of the IRS rank and file employees, these well-documented customer service improvements could not have been accomplished in the short time frame in which they occurred. We are at a critical point in our restructuring efforts at the IRS. First, technology improvements and investments must continue to give the IRS and employees the tools that they need to do the work that America's taxpayers needs and wants done. Next, since 1993, staffing levels at the IRS have been reduced by 17,000 FTEs. Yet during this period, IRS toll-free phone services and web-based services for taxpayers have improved and taxpayers have more options for filing their tax returns. Our employees have made great strides in customer service at the IRS while continuing to perform the necessary functions of ensuring that the taxes that are due to the Treasury are paid. Additionally, Congress has made hundreds of changes to the tax codes in the past three years. In fact, the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997 alone made 801 tax law changes. Next, continued record economic growth in this country has led to an increased number of tax returns and more complexities in taxpayer and business filings. The bottom line is the IRS workforce is being asked to do considerably more work with fewer resources. And while I applaud advances in the use of technology at the IRS, and I commend this subcommittee's commitment to these improvements, technology alone cannot possibly manage the increasing workload at the IRS. For this reason, I wish to express NTEU's strong support for increased funding for staff training and the new IRS initiative, STABLE. This initiative will support the hiring of approximately 2,800 new employees at the IRS. The number of IRS revenue agents has declined by roughly 17% since 1995, and it will continue to decrease another 4% in this fiscal year. We need to reverse the severe cuts in IRS staffing levels and approve this stable request. One last thing I would like to mention is that IRS employees continue to work in fear of Section 1203 of the Revenue Restructuring Act. As you know, Section 1203 lists 10 infractions known as the 10 deadly sins for which IRS employees face mandatory dismissal. The broad scope and vague nature of these 10 deadly sins have created anxiety and confusion in the workplace. Just last week, the House Ways and Means Committee approved legislation which would waive penalties for taxpayers who do not pay their taxes on time. Yet, if IRS employees are as little as one day late in paying their taxes, they are subject to mandatory dismissal. NTEU vigorously opposed Section 1203 
and continues to believe that this section of the Restructuring Act should be repealed. I am hopeful that this subcommittee will work with NTU and Commissioner Rosati to address this issue. In summary, since 1992, the IRS workforce has declined by more than 16 percent. In the meantime, demands on IRS employees have increased significantly. Unless Congress gives the IRS the staffing and the resources for technology necessary to do the job and the staffing necessary, our entire tax system will be threatened and we will not be able to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear today. Thank you very much. And our next presenter is W. Val Ovison, National Taxpayer Advocate, Internal Revenue Service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you here today and to talk a little bit about the role of the Taxpayer Advocate. Uh, the Taxpayer Advocate Service is the name we have adopted internally uh, in helping taxpayers to resolve their problems with the IRS. I've now been the National Taxpayer Advocate for 18 months. And during that 18 months, we've implemented the provisions of RRA 98 within the Taxpayer Advocate Service or in the process of implementing them. Many of them, as Commissioner Rosati mentioned, will take some time to actually play themselves out. The restructuring provided opportunities for the taxpayer advocates across this country to be better positioned, better trained, and more focused to address the problems that the taxpayers are facing. I am pleased to report to you that the new Taxpayer Advocate Service officially transitioned as a modernized organization on March 12th of yeah, 2000. Every state now has at least one local taxpayer advocate who works to resolve problems that individual taxpayers have with the IRS. Uh, many states have multiples uh, depending on the population and other factors. They also address taxpayer problems within the IRS, policy and procedural fail failures, uh, and recommend solutions to improve those problems. Between October 1st of 1999 and March 31st of year 2000, the taxpayer advocates across this country closed 1,400 cases, or excuse me, 114,000 cases. During fiscal year 1999, taxpayer advocates worked on more than 292,000 uh, taxpayer cases to help resolve their problems with the IRS. And almost 93,000 of those cases met the expanded hardship criteria that was defined in RRA 98. Uh, RRA 98 expanded the authority to issue taxpayer assistance orders when taxpayers are suffering or about to suffer a significant hardship. We worked with frontline IRS employees in an effort to resolve taxpayer problems and knowing that uh, we have the authority to issue the taxpayer assistance order is usually enough to convince the functional IRS employees to work with the taxpayer to resolve the issue. So far this fiscal year, we have issued three taxpayer assist assistance orders. During fiscal year 1999, we issued five. We identified and monitored the progress of procedural and systemic changes um, designed to benefit taxpayers. For example, we worked with the IRS operations to delay the implementation of some of the procedural changes related to secondary Social Security number matching. By negotiating a change to the implementation date, we prevented uh, refund delays and communications frustrations for thousands of taxpayers. In addition, we worked with a variety of stakeholders to identify legislative changes. In the fiscal year 1999 report, I included several recommendations related to penalty and interest administration and a proposal that would allow the IRS to correct its own errors. Amazing as that sounds, that's something that needs to be corrected. I am pleased that several of these provisions are included in the proposed, proposed Taxpayer Bill of Rights uh, 2000. Uh, my annual report to Congress includes a ranked list of the top 20 most serious problems facing taxpayers. Today I'd like to focus on four of those. The complexity of the tax code remains the most serious problem facing taxpayers. I believe that the single most complicating factor of the tax administration is the frequency and number of changes to the tax law. I encourage you to reduce the complexity of the existing laws or at least to slow down the frequency of change. Number two, the IRS uh, 
uh, must be able to communicate with taxpayers regarding account activity and computer-generated compliance notices. This means the toll-free telephone service must be improved, and I say that recognizing that some tremendous improvements have been made over the last year, and there's still not enough. The IRS must ensure that taxpayers can get in, in um, by as assisting a staff or getting into an, an individual who can help them with their problems and who can answer the phone. It is equally important that Congress fund this critical activity. Um, RRA 98 provisions expanded the innocent spouse relief uh, available to taxpayers and they're filing in large numbers. The sheer volume of cases stretches the ability of the system to deal with these cases. The IRS must reduce the processing times, increase the training, and ensure that all levels of the agency have internalized the new requirements of this law in order to get it right in the future. Uh, offer and compromise is another area of RA 98 that I'd like to talk about for a moment. This provided the authority to resolve collections issues um, that the IRS now has the authority to compromise uh, based on the effective tax administration criteria. The training needs are tremendous, the volumes are much greater than anticipated, and the IRS must speed up the process so that taxpayers can get timely decisions to these critical issues. The changes being made as a result of the modernized, uh, modernization are placing the service in a better position to understand the problems, the frustrations, and the needs of taxpayers. The new operating divisions will be a catalyst to improving service to the IRS and to make progress in eliminating problems uh, that, that are on my top 20 lists. Um, in conclusion, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, the Taxpayer Advocates uh, mission statement is to help taxpayers resolve problems that taxpayers are having with the IRS and with your continued support and the support of the Treasury Department and uh, all of the IRS employees, we can continue to make progress toward that goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we now have Mr. David L. Keating, the Senior Counselor, National Taxpayers Union. Mr. Keating. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Turner, members of the subcommittee, I thank you for the invitation this morning to testify on the IRS, and I appreciate your continued interest in how the IRS is operating. A historic step was taken two years ago when the Congress passed and the President signed into law the Internal Revenue Service Restructuring and Reform Act. As a member of the Commission on Restructuring the IRS, I was both proud and pleased to see that Congress not only agreed to the far-reaching reforms that we recommended, but went a few more steps beyond. While a promising start has been made by the IRS, I think it's still far too early to conclude whether reform efforts will succeed or fail. If reform is successful, it will take many years before the average taxpayer will notice substantial improvements in the day-to-day -day operations of the IRS, especially in the audit and collection area. The risk is, of failure is still high due to the tax law's growing complexity, the agency's culture that still resists change, criticism, and independent advocacy for taxpayers, and, I think this is equally important, the possibility that elected officials will pressure the IRS to increase enforcement at the expense of fairness. There are both hopeful signs and discouraging signs. Uh, I'm hopeful the agency will improve because Congress continues to show genuine interest in how it operates. This is something that we have not seen in years past uh, before the commission was established to review the IRS. Congress also passed much needed taxpayers' rights provisions. We're also very much impressed with the work of the commissioner and the caliber of several of the people he's hired to help him improve the IRS. We bling, believe he brings the right background and attitude to the job, and we've had the pleasure to meet with him. He's proven, I think, beyond a doubt that a commissioner does not have to be a tax lawyer or accountant, and I think, uh, in fact, a good case can be made that we may be better off without commissioners who are tax lawyers or accountants, at least with this one. I do want to say a few things about the IRS Oversight Board. My uh, testimony was uh, quoted earlier. But I, I really do think it was important for the uh, administration to meet the legal deadline. It was over a year late. And we're still waiting, unfortunately, for the nominees to be confirmed due to an unrelated controversy uh, in the Senate. And I call on the administration today 
to encourage the unnamed Democratic senator who was placed a hold on at least one of these nominees and prevented the Senate from considering all of them to release that hold and let's get these nominees confirmed and get them to work. They should have been on the job quite some time ago and I think it's unconscionable that we're holding up confirmation of these nominees for some issue unrelated to the issue of tax administration in the IRS. The IRS touches essentially every American citizen, directly or indirectly. And the unrelated controversy that is being talked about in the Senate, uh, my understanding is, concerns some ambassador or some nomination to some country that probably isn't even that large, certainly not compared to the population of taxpayers. So I think the administration should work with uh, the party colleagues in the Senate, get that hold released, get these nominees confirmed. I also do want to say a few words about IRS culture. I think it's very important that the agency's culture be changed, and they are working very diligently to do that. This, too, requires ongoing commitment by the Congress. For far too long in the past, the IRS emphasized tax collection as opposed to faithful interpretation of the law and respect for taxpayers' rights. Much of that attitude, I think, developed over the years in the 1970s and 1980s pressure placed on the agency by previous Congresses to increase revenues so that Congress would not have to increase tax rates to close the deficit. As a result, the IRS developed internal statistics that tracked enforcement actions while neglecting agency compliance with laws, regulations, and its own internal revenue manual. Recent news accounts and some members of Congress and candidates have raised concerns about the IRS's level of enforcement actions in the previous fiscal year. While we can understand these concerns, we think they are misplaced at this time. The IRS is in the middle of a massive restructuring and retraining program. In our view, the recent collection statistics are almost meaningless. Those who expressed a concern about the latent enforcement statistics seem unconcerned by recent reports from the Inspector General for Tax Administration that show the IRS failed to follow the law, regulations, or internal guidelines in roughly one of three enforcement actions reviewed by the Inspector General. We think this error rate is also completely unacceptable. We do note that the IRS is moving ahead with balanced measurement statistics, and we're very optimistic that these will help ensure fair collection and fair treatment of taxpayers in the future. My statement also <clears throat> discusses briefly, and in some detail, I should say, actually, uh, the, the IRS may soon administratively define the power of the National Taxpayer Advocate to issue a taxpayer assistance order. We think the law is rather clear and we're rather puzzled uh, of the need to perhaps administratively define and we fear limit that uh, power, which we think the power is quite clear. The advocate can order the IRS to take any action that the IRS could take on its own. I've spoken with the Commissioner on this and I know they are working on it diligently, but the same IRS that doesn't think that it can post taxpayers who, do, who are due refunds on the Internet because they are allowed to send press releases out to every newspaper in the country, but they can't take the same press release and put it on the Internet, uh, shows an IRS that tries to adhere to the law to its letter. Uh, yet I think the law regarding the taxpayer advocate is equally clear and uh, the advocate's power should be duly recognized in any administrative action. One final point I'd like to make here, two final points, if I might. Uh, while we applaud the IRS efforts to publish photos of missing children on pages of tax form instruction booklets, uh, we wonder why the IRS will not be doing, is not doing more to reunite millions of parents with their missing part of their tax refunds. The Inspector General uh, noted that the IRS is uh, not bringing to the attention of perhaps one, I think it's 1.7 million taxpayers who appeared to have forgotten to claim the child tax credit last year, and presumably they'll make the same error this year. Uh, we found the agency's response to the Inspector General's uh, report unsatisfactory and unacceptable, and we think if there are 1.7 million taxpayers who may have forgotten a tax credit, the IRS should tell them that they may have forgotten it. The final point I'd like to make is the issue of simplification. Uh, as Val Oveson has stated, and many of us have stated, uh, the tax law is so complicated, nobody understands it. 
yet we've expected the IRS to enforce and administer this law. One of the uh, recommendations not taken up by the Congress from the National Commission was some sort of uh, procedure to establish a quadrennial simplification process or additional simplification incentives beyond a simple report by the Ways and Means and Je Joint Tax Committee on pending legislation. I, I would like to bring to the committee's attention and the public's attention the interest in simplification was recently demonstrated by an unprecedented joint initiative, the American Bar Association, the American Institute of Certified Public Account Accountants, and the Tax Executives Institute that recommended 10 ways to simplify the law. And many of these recommendations were quite good, and we commend the them to the Congress. Uh, we see no reason, for example, why there has to be multiple definitions of a child under the tax law. Uh, to claim various tax breaks, such as tax credit, earned income credit, and personal exemption. It's ridiculous. Uh, it makes things complicated for the taxpayer as well as the IRS. Again, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Turner, members of the committee, for holding this hearing and for your continued interest in the IRS. Thank all of you, because each of you has raised some very interesting points, and we hope to now pursue them. And we'll start with Mr. Walden, the uh, representative from Oregon, uh, to begin the questioning. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Rosati, I thank you for being here today and, and for the work you're doing to uh, improve the situation at the IRS. Uh, I'm curious as to what you believe are the major obstacles in developing a measure of voluntary compliance. You see well, the, the, the difficulty um, is finding a way to do that measurement without being overly intrusive or burdensome on otherwise compliant taxpayers. And I think Ms. Wrightson gave one of the better expositions that I've ever heard of what's involved in doing this and, and why it's necessary. Uh, so what we are working on is, um, is a plan or a proposal for how to get the necessary information that we need to measure voluntary compliance and figure out how to target our audit resources where they really are needed and not where they're not needed. That's the reason we do it. Uh, we're working on a plan to figure out how to do that with the least burden on the taxpayers. Um, it, it will never be reduced to zero because in some way, like jury duty, I mean, you have to have some people that go to a jury, you know, to, 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 to basically make the justice system fair, and it's certainly burdensome on the people that do it while they do it. So there's going to be some burden uh, to do this measurement process. But what, what we're working on is trying to figure out a way that would re basically do two things to reduce the burden. One is to reduce the number of taxpayers that need to be surveyed, if you will. And secondly, reduce the amount of time it will take uh, for them to, um, to, to be part of this process. We have not yet completed that. We've been working on it. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, this is one of the first things that amazed me, frankly, when I got to the IRS, because I always heard that there was these numbers like 87 percent of the people, you know, comply and all that. So where did that number come from? Well, turns out it came from some very old studies that are, that are no longer valid. Um, and I realized that we had to do something about this. So we have been working on it, and I think we are reasonably close to having what I consider an acceptable proposal, but, um, but we're not quite there yet. I, I think I read in somebody's testimony, perhaps yours, that there's a $231 billion in uncollected taxes out there. Is that... Well, there's, on the books, there's something like 220 or 230 billion of, you know, a whole variety of numbers that represent uh, assessments. We're required to keep them for 10 years, as well as the in interest in penalties. That, that is, frankly, not a valid number as to what could be collected. A lot of that is bankrupt corporations from years ago that are still kept on the books just because they're for, there for 10 years. According to, the, um, according to the GAO audit of our 1999 financial statements, on the balance sheet there was, if my number is right, I think it was 20, 21 billion. Um, I'm not... You know, I, yeah, I'm I, not the financial well, it was, person. It was but somewhere I think in the that's 20. Right. I, I can get you that. It was either 21 or 20. It was somewhere in that range. Is the is the number that was viewed as actually collectible okay. amounts that we should be able to collect, um, which actually went down slightly from the preceding year. There's another. There's another array of money in that 20 billion that could possibly be collected that represents what are called compliance assessments. These are assessments where we've um, proposed, uh, like say, an adjustment to your tax. A bill, but you as a taxpayer have not accepted it, so it's still in a, let's say, a, a disputed category, and some of that may turn out to be money. So there is a significant amount of money that is um, out there, but it's not 221 billion. 
You weren't referring to my taxes personally. No, no sir. Okay. I meant you generically as, pardon me for using that. I just no. meant generically as, as, as you as a taxpayer. It is the 20, it is 21. 21 right. billion. Right. Okay, so uh, what about putting out some of that to uh, private collection process? I know Department of Education elsewhere has worked yeah. pretty effectively yeah. trying to recapture overdue student loans yeah. using the private sector in a yeah, the, responsible way. Yes, th this is a matter that uh, I know the chairman has, has a great interest in, and I, something that I personally in my previous life have, have actually worked on and made, done successfully. I think that it's, it, it, that, that possibility exists, in the f but I think, very honestly, where we are right now is that our whole tax collection process, and I brought a chart for one of these hearings that showed with, the, with what it is because of our computer systems, our internal rules, and the recently passed Restructuring Act is so complicated that it is really, and, and our data systems are so poor, that it's really hard to figure out how you could ever extract a portion of that and turn it over to anybody uh, very, very effectively in today's world. I think as we re-engineer it, those possibilities may well exist. Um, and, uh, you know, we, as I said in my early testimony, that's one of the major initiatives of our re-engineering is re-engineering the collection process. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Yeah, okay, uh, the gentleman from Texas, uh, Mr. Turner. Uh, Ms. Reifston, you were talking about voluntary compliance. Is it, is it correct that there is no random audit system at the IRS any longer? Well, there is no, hopefully there is no random audit system at the IRS because one shouldn't audit at random. Um, the, what we're really talking about here is uh, the random selection of returns to audit. So that, and in fact, today there is no random selection process. IRS had a process in place, uh, t I think the last one was probably 10 to 12 years ago, maybe even 13. Uh, it abandoned that process because it was viewed as too onerous to um, compliant taxpayers and politically sensitive. Um, so there is not one now. We, we believe, like the commissioner, that as they go forward, and they're going to have to do some measure probably of randomly selected returns. However, n no one knows right now how much that will be required. For example, IRS could use more information that it already has about, re about taxpayers. It could audit much smaller numbers. It could do it on a continuous basis. But it doesn't have it now, and it probably will need some measure of that in the future in order to get accurate and reliable uh, indicators of voluntary compliance. And did I read somewhere that the IRS is working on that, but it's about two or three years off before they may be able to do it? The, as the commissioner said, they are working on something called the National Compliance Survey. Do I have that right, NCS? Um, they've been holding it fairly close, I think, for obvious reasons. It's going to be politically sensitive. Um, we have not um, had access to look at what they're doing. I think we enjoy a fairly good close communication with the commissioner. Um, I know our Comptroller General and he meet every six months or so to talk and this issue came up. So I expect we'll be looking at that in the future and provide to them again our feedback as to whether this, the strategy that they're using is the one with the least burden but also providing reliable results. Thank you. Ms. Kelly, you were uh, critical of Section 1203, uh, and I understand your concerns. Uh, I am curious as to how many employees have been dismissed under the new Section 1203 um, to give me some feel for the impact, the actual impact upon IRS employees. Uh, to date, the numbers are actually probably just in the double digits. It's less than 100. And Commissioner Rosati probably knows the exact number is. Um, uh, there are reports issued every quarter on these. Um, part of the problem and the, the fear that's created among employees uh, is that even if in the end there's not the ultimate termination, um, the process that employees go through during that period of time uh, pretty much puts them in a position where they're just afraid to do much of anything. Um, the, there are already processes in place in the IRS that require, under the rules of conduct, that employees file tax returns, of course, and pay their taxes. And there has always been a process in place to deal with employees who don't do that on a, um, as required under law. 
and it's a process that has worked. So that those parts of 1203 um, just haven't, in our opinion, haven't been necessary and have led to unnecessary fears and investigations. And it also has resulted in, in some cases, managers being afraid of making a wrong decision because of this overview of 1203. And that is just one example of 1203. There are, of course, 10. And the one that I cited was about the paying taxes late. Commissioner, what's your, your well, impression of uh, Section 1203 and how it's well, worked? Well, let, first let me just give the number. It's actually been 17 since, the, since these... Uh, there have been 17 employees actually finished through the termination process. There were a few others that resigned prior, you know, without actually being terminated. Um, and, and, and I have to say that most of those employees, as Ms. Kelly said, probably would have been, if not terminated, at least severely disciplined even without 1203 because they, they really were serious cases. Um, I, I have to say that this provision has turned out to be one of the most difficult provisions to administer properly of any of the provisions of the Restructuring and Reform Act simply because of the, um, both the practical difficulty of learning how to apply it, but also the psychological problems of, on the one hand, you know, trying to follow through on the intent of Congress that serious misconduct be disciplined and people be terminated, which we have done. On the other hand, trying to reassure employees, what I believe is true, and have said right from the beginning, that this was not intended, was never intended, and as long as we're here administering it, will never be administered in such a way as to provide a penalty or a termination penalty, especially for an employee who simply, for example, makes an honest mistake in, 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 the, in the normal course of their job. That is not the intent. The difficulty is that Although I think we have made some progress in getting that point across, there is still this fear out there that, well, even if I'm not ultimately terminated, I'm going to go through a, you know, a, a long and very unpleasant process, potentially being investigated and have this threat hanging over me. Um, and you know, that 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 is a fact that 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 does exist out there. So, what we're trying to do, in in, in since this law is on the books and it is there is to administer it in a very fair and very, uh, um, you know, a transparent way so that people know what we're actually doing. I mean, one of the, probably the most important thing that we've done, uh, one of the most important things that we've done, as Ms. Kelly said, is to actually publish re on a regular basis all the actions that are taken. By the way, not just under 1203, but all the disciplinary actions. It's a very mysterious area in the past. Nobody actually knew, you know, what kind of actions were taken, and there were all kinds of rumors that spread. So we've taken to, actually, I must say, with great cooperation from NTU, it was really their idea to do this, um, to publish on a regular basis without identifying specifically named employees, of course, but nevertheless to identify not only on a statistical basis, but a complete list of all the disciplinary actions that are taken and what levels they're taken so that people will actually know how this process is really being administered. And I believe that in practice, we can administer it so that we will not terminate employees that shouldn't be. But whether we can convince people, you know, that, that, that then to, 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 to be more comfortable with the fact that, um, that, the, that, that this process exists is, is where we're, I think, going to have the most, most difficulty. Thank you. Any other questions? Gentleman from Oregon? Gentleman from Texas? Okay. But well, I, I want to follow up with Mr. Rosati. Uh, what's your assessment of the morale of the IRS employees currently? I mean, they've gone through quite a bit yeah. of stress because of restructuring legislation, and now we heard the specific problem on 1203. Uh, uh, give us an assessment. From well, your I point think that Ms. Kelly says it's not too good. I just want to hear. From I, your I point of would I would concur with that. And we have surveys. We do a regular survey, full census survey of of all IRS employees, and then we do other samples, and you know. More than that, I mean, we travel around a lot and talk. To, I personally travel almost all the time talking to people. It, it, it is varied by different different segments of the of the of the. Um, of, we have a hundred thousand person workforce. Um, I would say that the the field compliance employees, especially the collection employees and the exam employees, who are the ones that had the most pervasive changes. Uh, as a result of the Restructuring Act, and we're, we're the ones that took took some of the criticisms uh, most most personally. I think that there is where we have our most significant morale problems. Uh, they're learning how to implement these new provisions. They're learning what it means to, uh, again, as I have to say, Ms. Wrightson was very articulate in saying that our goal is to be 
provide good service and provide taxpayer rights to all taxpayers, but also to enforce the law for the people that are not willing to comply. You know, doing both of those things, it's harder to learn how to do two things at the same time than one thing at the same time. Um, those are all things that are learning process. So I think if you look at the field compliance employees where they've had the biggest change, certainly I would, I would not describe the morale there as good. Um, I think we've gotten by some of the really serious fears about 1203 to some degree. Um, we've started to put the balanced measurement system in place. We've certainly done a lot of training. I could go on and on and talk about all the things that we've done, but I think that we are still at a fair low point. Now, I will say um, that um, violating my own rule that it's okay to make predictions as long as they're not about the future, uh, I'll go off on a limb and predict that that this fiscal year, in terms of the field compliance, will be sort of the, we will hit the bottom in terms of both morale and some of the statistics, and that in 2001, especially if we get the budget request approved, we will see a material turnaround, because we will have a new organization structure in place, we'll have the balanced measurement system in place for a longer period of time. We will have gotten a lot of the training issues resolved, uh, at least to a certain level, and I, I, I do believe that we will see in several tangible measures of both morale and operational effectiveness, some improvements uh, during 2001 um, in, the, in the area where we have the greatest weakness today. Let me ask you about the level of supervisorial training. Do you have enough funds there and enough people to... Yes. That's how I know when I was at your swearing in, yeah. you said this is going to take me a few years. And well, no it's a very, we all very important. That. That's but a very important... Training is key, our it, human resources. It is important, and you mentioned specifically the supervisory training. I think that the answer to your question is the Congress did provide that particular funding, and so I can't use that as an excuse, if you will. Okay, I mean, the, the funding for the training has, has, has improved significantly. What we have is, though, a job where, you know, training is one thing and learning is something else, okay? I mean, we have a learning process, and, you know, this S-curve that I put up could be used for a lot of things that we're learning at the IRS. Um, in, the, in the case of the first-line supervisors, especially in exam and collection, the big learning process is how do we, how do we manage in a world where it's not just one thing that we're measuring, but it's two or three two things we're measuring. We want to provide taxpayer service and taxpayer rates. We also want to collect the money. That is, a, that is a learning process that many businesses have gone through. You know, every business has to do the same thing. Um, it's starting to get there. Uh, we, we did one thing recently that was never done before. We brought all of the first-line managers for our field collection organization, which was about 550. These are the first line, the first level of management, the group supervisors that supervise the collection employees. We brought them all together in one place, about 550 of them, for a three-day training session. And all of our top executives were there uh, for almost the entire time. And they were some of the employees that, some of the managers that I'd say, first of all, are the most critical in terms of turning this whole thing where we want it to go. And second of all, you know, probably had some of the more significant morale problems. Um, um, you know, the General Eisenhower said one time that when he hears his, his generals say that there's a morale problem, he thinks that they're the ones that may have the morale problem. Well, I think that in the case of our managers, you know, they were talking about the employees' morale problem. They're the ones that had morale problems legit, for very legitimate, understandable reasons. I think in that meeting we made a significant turnaround because we began to get down to very concrete details about what we really expect uh, in the collection area for people to do and what we don't expect them to do. And most importantly, um, just created an atmosphere of support for what we did. And we acknowledged very openly that there are a long list of things that, that we as the top management have to, have to explain better or resolve and how we're going to go about reconciling these competing objectives, which was, which was a good thing for them to hear. So that's a step, I mean, but there are many steps. My bottom line conclusion is I think that we will uh, that this year we'll, we will sort of hit bottom, if you will, and I really do s believe that with some luck, and especially if we can get a little bit of resource to, to, to meet some of these stopgap staffing problems, that next year, meaning fiscal 2001, we will see, you know, some noticeable indicators of improvement in the field area, in the, in the customer service area, in the phones and so forth. We've already had some noticeable improvement, but I'm talking about in the area where we have the most problems still. Well, as you said, uh, dear to my heart is the Debt Collection Act of 1996. 
and uh, we put that on the books through using the omnibus appropriations bill, which nobody could veto it that way. And Ms. Maloney, the ranking Democrat then, was very helpful with that. Uh, could you give me an idea of what do we do in terms of someone that has a debt to IRS in terms of the number of letters they go from IRS, the telephones they go, and to, if any degree, you have a revenue officer knock on their door? Well, I think that the, this is the, the chart that I think I showed you that you took back to your office uh, last time. Uh, and unfortunately, we still have that long process. You got a broader audience. Today. Yeah, well, it, it really is. I mean, the, here's, a, here's a simple way to understand it is that if you look at the main resources we have in, in debt collection, which are our phones and, and revenue officers, about 90% of their time is spent on accounts that are more than six months old. And if you looked at the revenue officer inventories, many of those would be, would be a couple of years old. And that's, that's not because they are doing the wrong thing as employees. It's just the process. Some of it is defined in regulations. Some of it is defined in just procedures. M all of it is embedded in our computer systems. A lot of it is related to the fragmentation of, of our collection organizations. You know, it's just not a very easy thing to fix. But we're moving one step at a time. Now, one step will be in place by the end of this year, a very important step, which is we will have consolidated the organization, so we will have uh, collection processes, you know, managed in a more more integrated way. We've, we're making some smaller steps that we can do within our existing technology later this summer on our phone collection operations to, to accelerate some things. And then the really big opportunity is through this re-engineering process, uh, which will basically um, replace the technology underpinnings, but also the business practices, then at that point we can be more effective in using various kinds of resources to do debt collection. Uh, your predecessor, when I discussed the matter with her, uh, they had, as I looked at your financials, this is back in 94, 95, that it was uh, roughly uh, uh, 100 billion to 110 billion that had been sort of written off with the bankruptcies, as you said, with small business and this kind of thing. And they had another uh, pile that was roughly $60 billion they thought they could uh, collect. And I raised the obvious question, uh, besides your own revenue people, what about putting that out for debt collectors that know their business? And then I was told, oh no, there's privacy problems. Look, you just give them the address, you give them the amount, no privacy problem as to the details of their tax form, and if they have a gripe about what IRS is doing to them, then you put them into the revenue officers that are authorized to deal with that particular situation. Now, have you thought about going to your authorizing committees, Ways and Means in the House, Finance in the Senate, and get that authority for the private collectors, or do you feel you already have it? Well. I think that actually the, the way it works is that we, we, we could over, it's a little more complicated because you can't give out any information, even names and addresses under current law, but, but I think on the other hand, if we were to treat some people as contractors, we could get them to agree to certain, under even existing law, we probably could overcome, I say probably because anything that deals with these legal issues really requires research, we could probably overcome the privacy issues and, and basically I think we could, we could solve that particular part of the problem. The more serious problem right now is just the process that we have that is, is just, in, it's really not in a shape right now, very honestly, to pull a piece of this out and give it to somebody. If we did that, we would end up just having them fail, probably, and, and, and give a bad name to the whole thing. I'm not saying that it can't be done in the future, but I think there's some, some work we have to do to get the data in shape and to get the process simplified to at least a level where we could realistically turn over to it. And one opportunity that might exist longer term is, is that as we get to a newly re-engineered process, one of our challenges will be what we do with the old inventory because we will have to take our existing resources of revenue officers and others and apply them to more current work. And so then we would have this base of old work, and that might be an opportunity in the future. But we're probably, realistically, a couple years away from that. Well, I would also hope that the Treasury and IRS would look at the people that have taken claimed bankruptcy, and when they pop up again, and there's a pattern in practice of right. where they're milking the taxpayers, very frankly, and since those of us that pay our taxes aren't too happy when we see them getting away with murder.
And I would hope that the Treasury and the IRS would figure out a way to follow them through their business career and try to get some of the money back that are owed to the taxpayers of the country. Incidentally, the, the biggest obstacle in that area is our data systems because, you know, part of our problem is, is that, it's a, that, that the basic records don't allow us to point and make these relationships between one taxpayer and another. It's all one taxpayer number. It's, it's like the way that the old phone systems used to be. You know, the telephone companies used to build everything off the phone number because they thought everybody had one phone number. And that was one of the problems that they ran into that I used to work on in my old days. You know, when people started to get five phone numbers, how do you point them and make them one customer? The issue that we have is how do you track, as you say, a small business person or, or principal through multiple entities that they may have either at one time over time. Right now, our data systems don't, don't really provide very good support for that. One of the things that I've found when I'm looking at the IRS uh, uh, claims that go through our district office, and uh, you have some very good people at Laguna Niguel that we can talk to there, and I'm really interested in uh, the degree to which the uh, uh, tax uh, uh, payer advocate uh, with are, are you now handling those that come from uh, district offices? There's five, 435 district offices on the House side, or maybe four, uh, 40 with the uh, territories, and you've got 100 on the Senate side. So when we've got these cases of people that say, I've got a problem with the IRS, or others are obviously Social Security, Medicare, immigration, the whole works, when I look at the ones on IRS, the ones I've found over the years that bother me is one part of the IRS has put a lien on the person and they can't pay what the other part of the IRS is. Have we solved that problem? Uh, and the, and the right hand didn't seem to know what the left hand was doing, by the way. There are still challenges to those communications that you've mentioned, but Connie Adams is the taxpayer advocate in Naguna Nagel. And she reports now directly to me, uh, rather than the district director. Uh, and we are handling the congressional cases that you've mentioned, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, doing an adequate job of that and doing an excellent job of that. We well, we uh, have great praise for the people that are helping us solve this. And I, that's why I wanted to know, are we still going to the district directors, or do we strictly go to the taxpayer advocate? Again, the congressional uh, correspondence and uh, on the case, individual casework is being handled now by the taxpayer advocate. Uh, with the modernization program, uh, that is being solidified and standardized throughout the country, and, and hopefully it will continue to work well. Now, when you say you had taxpayer assistance orders five in fiscal year 99 and three in fiscal year 2000 so far, is that uh, then across the whole IRS system as to a generic issue, or is this one case? No, that's across the whole IRS, and I mentioned in my annual report uh, right up front that uh, I felt those numbers were, uh, were too small. Um, but you need to understand that there were this year there were nearly 90,000 application for taxpayer assistance orders. Uh, and the, the need to actually implement the taxpayer assistance order in the end was only used uh, the five times last year, three times so far this year. Uh, most of those situations are resolved by the taxpayer advocate uh, visiting with and talking with the individual that has the case in uh, either exam or collections uh, and working out an arrangement that, that's acceptable. Uh, but this is my uh, number one goal for this year is to get the taxpayer assistance order process uh, into a, a, a situation that is uh, more meaningful and more representative and that we have more experience with the taxpayer assistance orders uh, as per the intent of Congress, I believe. Uh, Mr. Keating uh, made a very interesting point in his testimony that the IRS is over-collecting millions of dollars every year because they're not informing taxpayers of their right to the child tax credit. And I wonder, Mr. Keating, how significant do you believe this problem is and what do you believe should be done about it? Well, I think it's especially interesting given the comparison to the way the IRS has acted in the past regarding their earned income credit. Uh, there have been examples in the past where the IRS sent checks out to people who didn't even qualify for the earned income credit, and then there was no chance of ever getting them.
money back from these people almost by definition. Uh, they've probably gone out and spent it, and these are people of modest means by and large. I think what should be done is what the Inspector General recommended, which is to at least send a notice to the taxpayer flagging a potential error on the return that may have resulted in an overpayment by the taxpayer and a smaller refund that the taxpayer may, may need. The, um, the, the IRS management response was that they were worried that taxpayers receiving such a notice would lower their withholding in response to the notice, but find out when they completed the subsequent tax returns they were not eligible for the credit. I think this is a very, uh, very small chance of that happening. Uh, first of all, three quarters, roughly, of all taxpayers receive refunds. Uh, I think even a smaller number go and adjust their withholding in the middle of the year in, res in response to an IRS letter uh, such as this. Uh, we believe that <clears throat> uh, not necessarily that the IRS should just automatically send a check. Uh, we think the notice should flag it and send a questionnaire to the taxpayer to go through the steps needed to ensure the taxpayer may actually be due the additional refund or reduce the the tax overpayment. So we think it can be done, and uh, we hope that it will be done. I don't know how many other areas of the law are like this. I suspect this is a uh, one that might be a problem because this is a, a new item in the tax code that just started, I believe, in the last tax filing season, and there are some taxpayers that haven't figured it out yet. Well, we uh, thank you for those suggestions, and uh, we have a few questions the staff on both sides would like to send you, for, and we'll put them at this place in the record, if you don't mind. Uh, let me just ask as uh, one more point. Uh, as many Americans work toward meeting the filing deadline, is there anything you wish to say to them, Commissioner? <laughs> Do it early and often, as the Irish say about <laughs> elections. Well, I just, I just want to say that I th hope that every taxpayer um, will have an increased level of confidence in the IRS interest in basically helping taxpayers get the right, pay the right tax, no more, no less. I, I do agree with Mr. Keating that it is our obligation to inform taxpayers of where they have credits due. As a matter of fact, we had a public service commercial that was, I think, pretty effective on uh, the child tax credit. So if they call us, I, I really hope that we're making some progress in, in, in getting taxpayers to have increased confidence that we're not there as the enemy, we're not there as an adversary, we're there as a resource to basically help people uh, get it right. And of course, we're also there uh, if there is that small group of taxpayers that wants to burden everybody else by not paying, we're also there to make the system fair and we, we are looking out uh, for those that are not willing to, to, to pay. But the majority are and I hope they will uh, recognize that that's what our interest is, is in helping to make the system fair and having them pay what they owe, no more, no less. Well, I thank you and I thank all of your colleagues here that have made excellent suggestions. And I want to thank the staff that prepared this hearing, J. Russell George, the staff director and chief counsel of the Subcommittee on Government Management back there against the wall, and uh, to my uh, left and your right, Louise de Benedetto, uh, who is the professional staff person on this issue, and a detailee from the General Accounting Office. Bonnie Heal, Director of Communications, professional staff member on the wall in the back there. Brian Sis, clerk, and Ryan McGee, staff assistant, and Michael Soon, a valued intern. And on the minority side, uh, Mr. the counsel to Mr. Turner is the ranking member Member is Trey Henderson and Jean Gosa, the minority clerk, and we thank Mel Jones for being the court reporter today. With that, we're adjourned.